episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by the good-looking folks at GoDaddy.com. Use our code Linux and save yourself some cash. This week on the Linux Action Show, we've got our hands on the Raspberry Pi. Find out what you can expect from this crazy tiny little device. Plus, tracking a stolen Linux laptop, big news for webOS, and so much more! Oh, this week! I kid you not! The Linux Action Show! Yes! Yes! And welcome to Season 22, Episode 6 of the Linux Action Show. My name is Brian. That guy next to me who's been gone the last few weeks is Chris. Hey there, B-Man. Good news. Your uh, netbook shrine wasn't for not Brian, because Asus is launching a new line of netbooks that That's run right. Linux. That's right. Yeah, uh, Asus, Asus quietly launching, and by quiet I mean... Super quiet getting coverage on every news outlet that talks about <laughs> Linux stuff that li people are interested in Linux follow, so thereby getting the message out to all of the relevant audience super quiet. Super quiet. Uh, yeah, it's totally quiet. No one's heard of this now. Triple E PC 1225C, B-Man. Man, just, Man that is a sexy product name. That is really good-looking machine, though, huh? Look at that. Look at yeah, that. Good that. Bad. I don't know about the chiclet, but hold on. You know what's yeah, funny? Yeah, chiclet's fine. Is you, sir. Oh, my God. So I was just listening to, like, Linux Action Show episode 70 on the pre-show live stream, mm. and... We were talking about the, the first Tripoli PC. Love those things. Oh my God, you should have heard us. We were just loving it so hard. I still love mine. Mine yeah. runs a 24-7, <laughs> except for when it goes down, BBS with like all these lines, and it's it's fantastic. All right, well, here's just a couple of that features. That thing is going to be in use forever. Let's see. Does the netbook, is the netbook still alive? It's going to have 11.6 inch okay, screen. Okay, that's not a netbook. I know, that's a right? laptop. With a 1366. How on earth is an almost 12 inch screen? With, with a 1366 by 768 resolution. Seriously, that's not a netbook. You can get a 1.6 or a 1.8 Atom. This looks like a great laptop. Like 320, I would consider getting 320 this laptop. gigs of hard drive. I would totally consider getting this laptop, but it is nowhere near a netbook. <laughs> Remember how that little little triple E 700 that's like this big yeah, yeah. is barely type onable. Does yours have the eight screens? Gigs? Of storage or it has four? Eight. Eight. Yeah. The one I had, the one yeah. I run the BBS on, has eight. No, no, no. It has six because it has a four gig and a two gig okay. SSD. Yeah. And uh, that that is a freaking netbook. It has one movable part, and that is the fan, the fan that never comes on because the CPU I is like so that. slow that it cannot right. produce any heat at all. That's the Celeron version, right? Yeah, it's the Celeron six sixty seven. So it's going to uh, it ship with Ubuntu twelve zero four, and uh, you can get a three. That's cool. And six cell batteries. I guess. Honestly, this looks really cool. Yeah. It's just not a netbook. It's no. just a no. it's just an awesome little tiny atom powered laptop. Well, so you brought a toy today. I sure did. Do you know we're gonna talk about it? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, but this here, and it's not like this is brand new or anything, it's a green screen. Yeah, the green screen key in this out yeah, a little yeah. bit. This is a uh, this is a Raspberry Pi. I'm holding my hand here. And uh, we're gonna be talking about that a little bit later in a little more in depth. Yep, yep. And, of course, also Matt's going to stop by with a how-to on how to track your Linux laptop if it gets stolen. I disagree with that. And it's software I've actually used to track Android before. It's open source, top to bottom, and uh, Matt's got a how-to to on Top to bottom. That. Yeah. You like that? Well, up here? And then down here? Oh, yeah. Whole thing? Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow, fancy. Uh, you've got an awesome uh, distro pick that we're going to get to. I've got an awesome Android pick. But before we do that, Danica wants to say good morning to Mr. Brian Lunduk from GoDaddy.com. There you zoom, go. There you go. Wait, wait. Zoom, oh, zoom there we go. I put it right between yeah, us and then just I don't down really care a little what you're bit. Doing, but you're not zooming in on no, no, just, right uh, now. Yeah, zoom in. Okay, right, zoom in a little more. Right, no. Whoa! Right. Well, get her back on screen. Okay, this is okay. ridiculous. This there, freaking. Wait, there. What? Wait, what? Oh, no more. Don't you do this. Oops. There she is. So now, Brian, Danica wants to stop by and let you know that GoDaddy has a new deal for the month of July. They have a special offer, a .com domain for just $4.95. Four dollars and I, ninety-five for a dot com, Brian. All I, all I hear you saying is I'm a jerk and I'm preventing Brian from looking at Danica. And uh, well, look at my hair though. Look at my hair. Brian. I don't talk to you. Brian. And uh, the thing is, Brian, is if you use the code, and I got to use a special code four ninety-five Linux when you check out. Uh, you'll you'll get that deal. And hmm. I actually just got myself two new domains. Three actually. I kind of went on a domain. Are bias, any but... of them dealing with Danica? Yes. Okay, I'm interested. Okay. Tell me more. Okay, all right. So, 
And I want to. You're lying to me. This is wisdom. I am totally going to sucker punch you. This is wisdom. I think you could you could use this for software. Lay the wisdom on me. I have I have registered. Ready for this? Ready. Uh, three custom domains to make things easier for people. Okay. And I'll tell you how they relate to Danica. I've always said that custom domains make things easier for people. JBLive.am, if you type that now into a Shoutcast-compatible client, will play our live 64-bit kilobit stream. And JBLive.fm will play the 128 kilobit stream, where you will hear ads on the Linux Action Show where we talk about Danica Patrick. Boom! Boom! Yeah, that's right. What's, right. the third one? What's the third I one? I did it. Oh, jblive.info, where you'll be able to find links and live stream <laughs> calendar and all that, but that's still under that's construction. so many domains. jblive.info is where you get calendar information and all that kind of stuff. This is all, I got, see, over the last few episodes, I've been talking about a new radio station we're working on. It's all, I'll talk about it more in the feedback we're going to do at the end of the show. Okay. I, I got stuff we're working you on. You got stuff. And so I needed domains to kind of make things a little more simple when you're on the go. You know, you think of a mobile device, you don't want to type in a long domain. So I thought... I'm going to get a domain to make things shorter for people. I think people can do the same thing because all of these are is just DNS forwarders to wherever I want them to actually go to. So they're super easy to maintain. If you want to do that with a .com, heck, y'all just use our code 495 Linux. Get yourself a .com for $4.95. You can do that for up to three domains, y'all. Three domains. Plus, they'll give you a discount on the yearly. I'm just going to say this straight up front. Everything you just told me now is irrelevant. But if you want to use one of those codes to register a domain, let's say this is just a picture of Danica Patrick dot com and you go there and it's nothing but one picture of Danica Patrick. That seems worthwhile. Actually, I don't know about these radio stations, Bull Malarkey, but a picture of Danica Patrick, uh, interesting also, and worthwhile. Side note, sounds a lot easier than what I'm working on. I gotta be honest with well, you. Dude, uh, you're making this way too hard on yourself. I think what folks need to do is do it. Right, I'll, make you, I'll make you a deal. Yeah. Alright, I'll do the this is just one picture of Danica okay, Patrick that right. never changes dot com. Okay, right. And you go ahead and create this right. giant radio infrastructure okay, okay. and let's, two months from now, see look back at, and yeah. see which one gets yeah. more traffic. Uh, yeah, also, which one, if you just put like one Google ad on there, which one makes more money? Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's not a bad idea, because you never know, man. You never know. She might not be on the page one of these mornings, and if that if that were to happen, we would need a backup website to go to. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. 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 So, thank you to GoDaddy for sponsoring this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. Alright, Brian, you want me to get to my Android pick, or what? Yeah, I guess. Okay. Because it's one that I was going to recommend. So, if you've got a website and you track it with that handy software that Scott, uh, not Skynet, uh, what's their name, Brian? Um, uh, Google. 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 If, yeah. if you want to you track your website with software from that company called Google, like the Google Analytics software, guess what? Good news for you, my friend. They now have a mobile app for your Android oh, device. It's so nice. It's so nice. It, and it runs really well on the tablet. Because yep. I do this for Lunduke.com. Yep. And uh, it even works with the real-time stuff. That is my favorite new feature of Google Analytics is real-time. Yeah, the and that's real, really... The real-time traffic is great. You can see what people are going to, where they came from. Yeah. And you can just... And it updates, like, every, like, half second. It's phenomenal. So uh, there you go. And, it's of course, it's free because it just goes along with the Google Analytics service. And uh, it doesn't feature uh, a couple of, like, the more drilled down things you can do. But, but heck, still... you know, if you're just on the go and want to see yeah. what's happening with your site, like, why yeah. is my freaking blog running so slow? You can just pop this up and go, oh, go. that's why. There awesome. You there yeah. you go. Right there. I just got on the front page of Dig. Just there kidding. That's not, no, you're not going to No, you're not going to get any traffic, traffic from, that. from that. No. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. All right, B-Man. Well, we've got a uh, a desktop pick and an and, or an, uh, and a Linux distro pick. What do you say we do this this year? Uh, you want to do the app pick or the Let's distro do the app pick? pick. The app right. pick is more ridiculous. Okay. All right, the app pick, and I don't know how to say this, it could be said as A-S-E Prite. Or Asprite. I think it's Asprite, right? Asprite. It almost looks like Aspartame. Um, it <laughs> it's is, aspartame, Brian. It is the most awesome pixel art editor in the universe. Oh, cool. It is glorious. Now, don't mind the screenshots. The screenshots are from the Windows version, but the UI is exactly the same on all platforms. It, uh, it has this cool, ridiculous, you know, very, very much kind of a mixture between 8-bit and 16-bit styled UI where the entire UI is custom on and it looks the same on every platform. It's so great. And not only is it, you know, pixel art, but it handles pixel art palettes really well and pixel art animation. Mm. And it is so animation. freaking wow. Nice. Wow. So I've been working in this thing for a while now, and it is just plain awesome. And it runs on every platform. Now, if you go to their website, uh, you'll notice you go to the download section. Oh, look, Windows. Oh, look, Mac. Oh, look, source code. Yeah, that's kind of annoying. Uh, right, but that's but what you do now. 
Well, no, 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 no. But I provide a Linux binary. Like, like this is what I'm saying. Like, you know, oh, you know, you see what I'm saying. Like, they don't, they don't provide directly a Linux binary, but it runs great on Linux. Gotcha. If you go over to playdeb.net, uh, you'll find a uh, pre-built uh, Debian file for it, which you can then convert to anything else. And yeah. there are this is in some of the other repositories oh, here. What a cool well. game right there. God, it's just great. See that? Look at that 2D space uh, trading combat. We've covered combat. that in the past. I want, I want to play that. We talked about that. About Maybe we should just skip. Five years ago. Why don't we skip the show and just play that? We could. All right. That'd be okay. great. All right. So that's pretty fantastic if you like pixel art. Yeah. All right. So the distro of the day is not all that random. Let's say I made this huge mistake, Brian, and I just, I made my directory, my home folder uh, partition. And yeah. you did. Way too small. <laughs> you totally did. Porn. And so now I need to increase the size of that partition and move things around. What, what would be a tool, Brian? What would be a tool that I might use to do well, that. I could say that you would download a live distribution on a live CD, pop it in there, and call that part ed magic. Now, mm. part ed magic it was picked kind of for a particular reason here. What? It's not random. Now, and you've probably talked about this in the show a little bit over the last few weeks, but the guy behind part ed magic, the main developer, is trying to make a living off of this amazing distribution he creates. Now, right, this right. distribution really mm. is kind of a pulling together of a lot of great tools and putting together in a really slick way that makes repartitioning and all sorts of things and all sorts of tasks so much easier. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. both Chris and I have relied on this in the past. Mm -hmm. It's a great tool. Especially and when you want to just kind of change things up without having to do a total reinstall and things like that. Exactly. Or just, you know, look at the look at the partition layout on a, on a hard drive you pop in and want to check out. It's great. Yeah. It's great. Now this and this guy's trying to make a living off of donations, basically just like I am. Um, except he he makes a really really low goal where he pretty much just wants to make minimum wage. And apparently he's got like family and kids and such. Wow. I think. Well, maybe you can make a little more than minimum somewhere. wage. Uh, may maybe that would be good if he could make a little more than minimum wage. Because yeah. I don't know if anyone else out there has tried to raise a, a family with a bunch of kids on minimum wage. But I'm kids guessing it yeah, costs a little bit of money. Um, so if you go over to part partedmagic.com, there's a little donate button on the page. The page isn't terribly well designed, but you can find all the stuff. <laughs> wow. You didn't have to throw that last thing in there. I mean, just, no. Well, you know. Your compliments, compliments but your website sucks. <laughs> So. This guy is awesome. This guy makes a great, great tool. The website does not need to be nice. I mean, let's be honest. No, this website right. could be just right. link to download, yeah. link to donate, right. and then a link to like a yeah, forum, like and it could be done. The other guy and in ugly his, as sin. That'd be fun. The other guy in his space is uh, Steve Gibson, and let's not talk about uh, GRC.com. Let's just not go there, okay? Dude, this is Parted Magic is fantastic. This Parted thing, Magic this is, thing the, looks is like the a way castle to go. compared to GRC.com. A castle, Brian. A castle. Freaking castle. beautiful castle. Well, there welcome we back, so anyway, man. That's awesome. How you been? Tired. I'm just now getting over being sick. So, yeah, you let's got, see. Like, you got like all kinds of all kinds of cross country sick. Before uh, the last time I was on the show, I think I wasn't on the last the last episode the first time because I was sick. Right. And then uh, I started got got this just raging sinus infection. And then I went on a cross country sick uh, right. <laughs> trip drive drive uh, to see two cousins get married. Right. Not, you know, to each other, but like. Different weddings. You know, I never, people, but it's good you but, made that. Yeah, yeah. just want to make that clear. They were, uh, you know, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, why? So, uh, but two different cousins getting two different weddings uh, a week apart. So I went to one, it was in Montana, and it was beautiful. You know, we got to drive from here to Montana, which I've is, you know, takes three and a half minutes. Mon Montana. Mon Montana. I would have liked to have seen Montana. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know why I'm trying to do it in a Sean Connery voice because he did not say I know. that. Well, I actually uh, made the joke the, in the first time you were gone. Humphrey you were in Red Montana. October's a great movie. I made the Mon Montana joke and I did it in a Sean Connery voice. Did you? Yeah. That's what I always did. <laughs> yeah, I, I did it probably 10 times while I was on the trip to Montana. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, so I went there, uh, and uh, then I went to Utah to see another wedding, and then I came home. But it, it just over this course of, you know, I went through Montana and Wyoming and Idaho and Utah, and I caught every freaking flu and cold I came across in, in five freaking states. This is why I never travel. Oh, man. Not true. So by the time I got home, I was just dying. The color that was coming out of my face was so... Kodachrome could not have captured this color. Really? Paul Simon had never envisioned Whoa. the ability to capture this much color. If he had, he would have made a song about the stuff coming out of my you face. You had like HDR snot? <laughs> yes, I had HDR snot. Wow. It was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, it was a fun trip, but oh my God. So I'm I'm just now on the on the up and up finally. Jeez. But holy moly. 
Well, Matt did a great job, so thank you, Matt, for filling in while the B-Man was out. Uh, Matt ended up getting sick last week. Did he really? Yeah, he got, he got like a uh, stomach flu. Oh, poor guy. But he, uh, he managed to uh, poop it all out and then uh, join us for over Skype and then go back to I'm glad I'm glad he managed to squeeze that one out. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's good for everybody. Yeah. Good for everybody involved. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, before we before we kick off to the last little bit. So uh, one thing I wanted to wanted what? to quickly no, touch on. Never. I, yeah. One. I, th- one who thing could have seen that coming? On. One th- one little thing. Um, so for those of you who've been waiting, you can grab the source code for Illumination Software Creator, the current release version, if you go over to lunduke.com now. Um, I just changed things over. I've uh, been trying to figure out a best way to, you know, make a living off at donations. Right, right. And uh, With going with the open source of the code so, yeah, and, so, and the whatnot. So I'm making all my own source uh, available, and I've, most of it's all up there now and all that good stuff. But um, uh, I realized I did something terribly wrong. Mm. I neglected to give any perk at all to people who donated basically so all the people that have donated so far did so because they are just amazing people they right they, they wanted they to didn't, see it like they didn't get anything for it like there was no benefit to them right so i'm like oh okay so i kind of put the call out i'm like guys you know uh you know I, I need i need a hand here because there's there was a little bit of drop off in donations and i'm like uh oh that's not good no. So what am what am I doing wrong? And what I the feedback I got back from everyone was I need to provide perks. Oh, I was going to say nudie pictures. Okay, all right. You I was going a different track. I was going a different. Track. I actually did get recommendations along those lines. Well, there you yeah. go. There you go. Um. So I. So now now there are some perks for people that uh, that donate, including access to the binaries, which I don't give to the public anymore. But of course, everything's GPL. So if people want to post binaries on their own sites, they're free to put them in repositories. They're free to. Um. They get a contributors post. So if you want to get a little advertising. Going, going it's a good way to get some advertising going and you get to vote on what i work on um so uh so now people get perks for donating. how are you gonna do the voting thing that seems like oh i'm building a whole system around it so there's two steps check this out so basically one is this kind of light reddity system where okay. people get to okay. vote on like a backlog okay. of interesting features well, you could just do a subreddit but you no, wouldn't know they're donors. No, 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 yeah, no, no, no. Would, yeah, right, Well, well right, no, it, right. it's something i need a little more control over yeah. and then the second step is a private vote little voting booth, a little voting booth software I'm putting on the site that I send the link out just to people that have donated in the oh, past I see, month. I see. And then they get to vote on the top 10 or whatever features to work on. So then they get to have an actual say on what I work on because they donated, which actually seems kind of cool to me. There you go. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see how well it works. But if you go over to lunduke.com and you want to support, you know, all sorts of awesome open source software and rub it in people's face who said that there's no way open source software can support people, which there's a lot of those people out there still yelling about that, um, that's a good way to do it. There you go. There you have it. All right, B-Man. Well, let's do the news. Okay. What's new in the news today? All right, B-Man, the top story on the news docket today. Open Web OS is here. It sure is. Yeah, actually, it's uh, it's interesting how they're doing this, too. This came out just a couple of days ago, and get ready for this. It's called the Community Edition, mm-hmm. and the Community Edition is focused on supporting the touchpad. So they're trying to get new updates out there for touchpad owners. Yep. Ah, now... Open Web OS 1.0, that release is, pl- is planned for September. It includes modernized technologies to better enable the community Thank to deploy Web OS to the hardware of their choice. I love modernized technologies well, so much. You do love the platform and hardware of your choice, Brian. I do love both do, of those things. Yeah. And modernized technologies. Uh, they're going to do things like a new Bluetooth stack. They're integrating, get ready for this, G Streamer. G streamer, I like that, and uh, all other kinds of things. So that'll be in September when the one that you can load on your own kind of tablet you start shipping. Choice. That's not far away. So uh, that's not far away at all. What is the chat room talking about? Uh, hmm. I don't know what the chat room is talking about. Chatter. But this actually looks pretty fantastic. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to load this up on anything because no, I, I don't have a tablet. No, I don't this have tablet. a tablet. Yeah. So I, I never. Have, I don't we've know. gone into that. I never got one. I never I, got one. I wanted to give a quick shout out. I have no idea what's going on with this. It hit the Linux Action Show subreddit and it was highly voted. This is a crop plat platform cross platform Android router. Uh, not not router like as in router, but router as in Roots you hook your Android, your Android phone up to a Windows, Mac, or Linux box, and yep. it'll root it for you. That's nice. Now it's got 84 days left. It's on it's on this kind of like Kickstarter type service. If, they say they only re- raised a dollar. Uh, I don't know if that means they've got no shot, but uh, <laughs> their their plan is for cross platform super one click is essentially uh, going to be a Windows only feature, but they uh, they will be possible to run other the other components on Mac and Linux. 
Um, but the, just a the one-click button, I guess, is only going to work on Windows. So they say the solution is the uh, cross-platform Android Router Project aims to create a cross-platform open-source Android routing solution to address these problems. Mm. Uh, so there you go. If you, uh, if, you, if you get in, you get perks kind of like you do on Kickstarter, and it's only a dollar to get in. That's cool. Release. So, you know, if, yeah, if that's interesting to you, go well, for it. I, I'm a big fan of rooting an Android device because I hate the idea of having a computer and not having administrative access over it. That just seems crazy to me. Crazy. Speaking of crazy. computers that you won't have administrative access over, Brian, Android 4.1 was announced by uh, the Googles uh, this week. And it changes everything. Okay. All right. So, did you happen to see what my reaction to the whole Google I.O. keynote was on Google Plus? No. Well, first of all, First of all, the whole parachuting thing that they did, the skydiving thing, then to the mountain bikes, then to the going down the side of the building was thing. Was awesome. You're right. It was pretty amazing. That was awesome. That okay. was awesome. All right. So that, that was really cool. That was really cool. Uh, now, outside of that, what was the first thing they touched on in the keynote? Jelly Bean. And what was the first feature of Jelly Bean that they announced? Project Butter. Project Butter, which then, they then rolled some <laughs> video demo of how slow ice cream sandwich is versus jelly bean using high-speed cameras. Uh -huh. Now, every time I have come on this show and I said, I really like Android, but I just feel like the interface is leggy and it doesn't snap like the iPad does. Yeah. People give me grief. They go, oh, come on. That's just the way you're seeing it. That's probably the way the vendor shipped software on their blah, blah, yabbity, yabbity, yabbity. Yeah. But now Google's like, oh, by the way, yeah, it is really laggy. Right. And we're finally fixing it and in, in version 4.1 and we're making a big deal about it, which so, is nice. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, it would have. Yeah. They probably should have addressed that a long time ago before the 27,000th complete rewrite of the interface, maybe. <laughs> um, but yeah. And I, I, uh, I, I think it would have been awesome. Like if they were going to make it faster, this would have been the perfect time to jump from the sugar meme to something healthier, like, yeah. like Android celery. <laughs> I don't know. No, I like you know, butter. Android, Android carrot stick. I don't know. Butter. But I'm so that's good. That's good. So of course that's I'm just that's just my personal soapbox. You know what they should have done? What? They should have jumped over to like cats. Yeah. And been like, this is Puma. God. Just for uh, the hell of it. No. So otherwise though, uh, Android Jelly Bean looks to be pretty sweet. One of the things that they have worked yeah, in well, there is it's good because everybody is already running ice cream sandwich and the entire world and they're like, "Man, we just need an upgrade because we've been running ice cream See, sandwich for so many years I think that's now." It. Although I think ice cream sandwich wasn't compelling enough of an upgrade. Are you kidding? None of them are compelling upgrades. Like it's <sighs> I, I, what's what's the real difference? What is the real functional? Di Wait, but but I mean, I mean, really? I do it for the performance, and also you know they have some. But new every upgrade, you're like, oh, I need that for the performance. Every upgrade, every single upgrade Android has ever had has been, oh, I okay, need the true, performance. True, that's so true. it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're running, you know, gingerbread or honeycomb or ice cream sandwich. Oh, I need that for the performance. I mean, okay. really? Oh, well, there's other things. They've, they've, re they've reworked the notification area. I like Chrome Android now ships by, just fine. But... Chrome ships by default, and Chrome was a good browser in that thing. They've they've sort of overworked. Yeah, they've overworked good. like a lot of little. There's like little gesture things you can do now. The whole widget system's been redone. So there's been improvements. I like that. It just feels too fast yeah. for me. Like I'm like slow down. Well, you got to be happy. Smell that... the flowers. Savor your ice cream you, sandwich. Get them on devices. It's first. not five zero. That's, that's you know, nice. they went 4-1, right? They went 4-1. So yeah. they kind of spaced it I think bit. they're just trying to catch up with iOS. Like, they want to be ca caught up number-wise with iOS. Got iOS 6 coming out. Maybe. They, they got to hurry those numbers up so they can get to, to Android 6, play and then the, boom. Play the Chrome and Firefox game. Yeah, where right. Yeah. Where they're in constant competition. Because what are we on? Firefox 27,000 now? 13 now. 13? Yeah, and, and Chrome is like 1 Do you million. When we were doing this show just a couple years ago, yeah. Firefox 5 came out. <laughs> 5. They just like, it was a different game back then. Also, uh, starting with Jelly Bean and really going down the road, uh, Flash is being phased out on the Android platform completely. Yeah. So, boom. What do you think of that? I, I think it's funny how it's being like presented to people they're like it's not that you're not going to have access to flash anymore it's that you're going to be free from flash now 
Yeah, I know. It's I like know, it's like it's like wait a minute, but the big the big one of the big things with Android was you could have Flash if you wanted yeah, it. Yeah. And now it's like you're free from that. Yeah. You don't have to worry about that yeah. anymore. Yeah. I'm like wait, <laughs> what? Right. Wait a Remember minute. Remember how that was a feature? On and the... wasn't there going to be a thing where it was like hey, Google was going to be taking over the development kind of stuff on the Linux side of things, and like they were helping out with the Android side of things as well. Yeah. And yeah. I thought it was like a big deal, and, and now it's like oh, so it's that's funny because you remember the Droid commercials important. were about like the Droid in the commercial would talk about how it can run flash yeah it was like a big friggin deal yeah and that was just like a year ago i just it's just funny how adobe never managed to deliver yeah i guess i I don't get what i mean it's not like i'm the hugest flash guy in the world i just i just think it's strange i just don't get adobe like adobe just does things that like they, they just don't do things that seem so obvious to everyone else they just get locked in with this almost apple like mentality about things and they just keep going until it's way too far like they never ever got Flash quite right on Android. No, they never did. And I don't. I it kind of sort of worked. Yeah, but they just didn't want to give up their market share. Yeah. Uh, one last Google thing from the I/O because uh, we're going to talk a lot about uh, the Google I/O stuff and how it relates to developers in Coder Radio. We're not, you know, this is the Linux Action Show. This stuff doesn't directly apply to Linux, except for this story does. This is interesting. Is Google introducing a is introducing a compute engine, which is a scale scale system where you can say, I want these many Linux boxes or I want this many Linux boxes, and you can up and down in the amount of cores you want. Uh, Google actually demonstrated a genetic application running on 600,000 cores on a Linux system. That's insane. Uh, they say that uh, you know you can, do, uh, you can do all kinds of things that you would bring. A, so basically, you get on here, you'd bring a job and have it compute out, and there you go. So think about, like, uh, wow. think about colleges that would, in the past... Have to build up an entire cluster to manage to do yeah. this, and now they can just basically outsource it to Google. Mm-hmm. That's pretty wild. Yeah, it's and, a smart uh, move on Google's part. Uh, Microsoft offers something kind of similar to this. So does Amazon, but uh, both. Yeah, but what I think the the big difference between what I see what Google's doing is they're trying to make it easy to scale it to m- multiple hundred thousand cores. Yeah, and uh, you whereas, really you really just hand it over to their system, and they yeah they right you handle you hand over run this piece of software to right. compute this project. Whereas on you know if you go through Amazon or or Azure over with Microsoft, you're really saying I want to be able to scale out an right, appliance right. for hosting and data processing Yeah, purposes. exactly. It's a little different. Yeah. Interesting. So interesting move by the Google, and uh, cool to see them using Linux on that. That's that very means, cool. That means more stuff will be written, targeted towards Linux for those types of applications. It's very cool. All right, B-Man, next story on the news doc. It's really been put in here to give a shout out to a company both you and I like. That's Fluendo and their awesome codec pack. I love that We've stuff. We've been using them for years, and they just released a new version. And the reason why I wanted to give this new version a shout out is uh, it improves some live streaming support, but it also uses uh, your GPU more efficiently for digital video decoding. I need to download this. I know, right? Yeah. So uh, you, get, uh, you, get, uh, you get some GPU management, you get better A264 support. Support. Uh, you also get uh, support for lossless AAC. So if you have somebody that's giving you music in like that Apple, uh, what's that Apple? They've got some lossless format. Yeah. Uh, and uh, RTP streams as well. So uh, the Jupiter Broadcasting live stream now is uh, supported by the Flundo Codec. Pack. Awesome. Our experience with them has been great. And if you want to legally watch all of these proprietary formats that you have to go get those shady codecs for, either through your repo or through some sort of script or something. You can go buy this bundle, and it's super easy to install. It integrates in with GStreamer, and then you just have the codecs available to anything that uses GStreamer. There's other ways to do it for other applications. It's great, and it's legal. Yeah, it's it. Well, yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, and you just you know what I do is I keep a zip version of it in my Dropbox, and anytime I load up a new Linux machine, yeah, I, just, I do too. I just extract it yeah. and throw it in. I, I have it. I have it in a little. A little uh, sitting on my home server at home. I just go fetch it, grab it, throw it on whatever okay. machine I'm on. It's super easy. The chat. The chat. It runs so much faster than a lot of the various other ones. Uh, L, L, Mr. Mango in the chat room is asking for the price. I, th- I want to say it's it not like, much. It was like under twenty bucks. Uh, I want to say like twenty five bucks, was something it? like that. Here, I'll go over. I'll go over to see if this. We're gonna click it. We're gonna figure this out live for you guys. You no, know, it's right funny. Now. I just had a flashback. We actually did this last time on the air when they had a new one. Oh. Twenty eight euros. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So they, there's an answer for you for people who yeah. spend euros. So I think that means it's like uh, yeah. So <laughs> I don't it's know. Probably it's, around thirty bucks. It's like US. thirty bucks ish. It's it's, yeah. it's 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 well worth it if you play media. And you want really high quality stuff. And if you do DVD playback and you really want, like, okay, so here's the little dirty thing to all of these codecs that are in the repos, like like the bad plugins and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. They're not always the highest quality software. No. That's the thing people don't realize. So sometimes your video actually won't look as good as it could if the decoding software isn't very intelligent about it. It's true. It it is kind of interesting. A lot of people who have never tried getting, like, the Fluendo codecs or anything else, they don't realize how 
good the picture can actually look mm -hmm. on some of the higher definition video yeah, files they've yeah. got. So it it's worth it if you care about the video. If you don't care all that much about the video quality or you're not too worried about maybe the area, the, the country you're in having some licensing issues, then it's not that big a deal. But I, I love them. I swear yeah. by those things. Too bad they don't advertise because, boy, we could give them a, we give them a good plug. All right, B-Man. We could. Let's just get, let's just kind of, uh, let's just, we'll just spend a little bit of time on this. We won't spend too much time, but... Frolics ran an article that was a repost of the blog from uh, one of the dolphin maintainers, or the dolphin maintainer, and uh, he essentially, in his blog post, made the assertion that perhaps KDE was no longer competitive with modern desktops, uh -huh. aka Windows 7, Mac OS 10, Lion Snow Leopard, and Android, and all those things. Uh, and he is. Does Android qualify as a blind desktop? I just, I just wanted to name a. <laughs> you just wanted I to put like one out, on a out there. Thought, you were you were doing wrong? great. And DOS and and and, uh, and uh, OS two warp. Uh, oh yeah, the OS two warp presentation manager. That's boom, good stuff. Boom, the Amiga boom, Workbench. Boom. boom. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, and and Robin J in the uh, JB Live chat room says he's right. He says he's right. So uh, chat room says XFCE, LXDE, E17, GNOME 2, KDE is awesome. There's love. What do you think, B-Man, is KDE? And let's be honest. Let's... Bah, 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 bah. Okay. Okay. All right. You're shaking your head like, no, it's, not. it's perfectly fine. It's great. Then why aren't you running it? Well, I am on one machine. No, it's my main mm -hmm. machine, though. That's what I... That, 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 but I'm also that. not running uh, Unity or GNOME Shell as my main machines. I know. I I'm know. also not running uh, Windows Explorer or this. the Mac OS X Jelly Bean of Doom UI. Is it... Is it does, so are you, running, are you not running KDE for the same reason you're not running Unity? Yeah. What is that reason? Because I want to run Xmonad. Why? Because it... Is awesome. It's, I, but it, I just, it's super crazy what's lightweight, the, what's crazy the, old school, and I like the tiling, uh, multi kind of desktop window manager thing that that it's got. It's a different paradigm for how I work. So I mean, I'm I'm not the right guy to ask because I'm not the average kid on the street who's going to look at a desktop and go, "Oh, that's dude, fancy. I want to use it." This is the fallacy that all people are under around the Linux scene. Nobody running Linux. The majority of people running Linux are not the average user. Well, that's we, it. we got yeah. a story about average users coming up, but like we all are high end users that are yeah. on Linux for the majority. Yeah, and I, so, I'm the wrong guy to ask if I mean because honestly, when I look at KDE, you know, four point eight, four point nine. What I'm saying is, I don't think you are the wrong guy to ask. I think you're exactly the the overall larger target audience for the Linux desktop. So, and what it is is these desktops are being written for the new mythical user that's never seen a computer before and never used an operating system is all of a sudden going to pop out of nowhere and sit down and use a desktop operating well, now, system. Now, so this particular developer, um, basically, so uh, he's the developer of Dolphin, right? Yeah. So he's the, the Dolphin file manager developer, which Dolphin's a great file manager. They've, yeah. they've done some really cool stuff yeah. with it. So from what I gathered, he just is tired of using KDE because he doesn't like the user experience anymore. Yeah, and he it's doesn't, not the technology. Right. It's and not the look and like, feel. Well, he he doesn't like the, the the workflow anymore. He feels like there's a disconnect between really really complex black back ends. Like he goes on to talk about KHTML and the rendering engine of web browsers. Yeah. And then how the, but the pressure on the simpler, more elegant interface to sit on top of that, and how he doesn't think KDE is quite meeting that goal. And in order for that to be met. It needs, a, it needs more people working more full-time on it, and he's not able to do that. That's one of the reasons he's stepping aside. Honestly, KDE could use more people working more full-time on it. I mean, it's, it's hard to build something that huge and that complex with, yeah. with a, a, a crew of ragtag, very, very part-tame, weekend, non-paid warriors, which I is think, mostly what we have. I think KDE is competitive is hard. in the sense that it fills a very good spot for people who are transitioning from Windows. And I don't mean to say, oh, okay, to use a Windows knockoff, but no. I think if you're coming from Windows XP, Windows 7, there are more things that translate to KDE that you can kind of go, you can map familiarities to. Yeah, typically the button sits in the lower left-hand corner. You click it, and you have a structured right. menu to launch your applications. Like, it, it does. Whereas it has Unity, like, Unity is very, like, there's just it's a few different. things. Like, everything's super crazy maximized, yeah. and your menus get lost, and your close buttons are on the wrong side, and there's all these little different things. So I think KDE is still very relevant in that stance. And the fact, the other, the other, fact of the matter about KDE is you can customize it to just about anything you want. No, I, I gotta ask. I thought you were all, like, Mr. KDE. I, well, I have eventually, this is the problem, is I have moved it over to one machine. And that's kind of where it's ended up Steady. sitting. It just stays there? You see, I'm, honestly, and I, I like have, it. I have KDE on one machine, and I keep up to date, and I test my apps against the latest revision of KDE, and I think it's great. Mm -hmm. I 
I really like KDE though. Like KDE is a fantastic desktop environment and a supporting yeah. set of technologies. They do an amazing job yeah. and I really, really like it. And what I'm excited about with KDE is I think it it translates very well with the work they're doing to tablets and, and everything else. Yeah. And, and that's, I think KDE is great that way. I, I don't really have anything bad to say about KDE. Developers who work on a project for more than a couple of years are going to get burnt out. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I had been developing Dolphin as a file manager for that well, many years, I would stand up and say, no more Dolphin! I hate this thing! I'm done! And I would just walk off and I'd start using GNOME or Xmonad or something else. I and it, it's just because you need a change of pace. So I don't really blame this no, guy. No, and it's just it's frustrating. Totally it's sense. frustrating if you know you need to be able to do more and you can't dedicate that time to it. So it's it, it's a weird thing. It's a weird it spot totally to be. It totally is. So, yeah. It totally is. But you sometimes you need a change of pace. And honestly, it sounded like this guy was like, you know what? Things mm -hmm. aren't perfect. I need a change of pace. But things aren't perfect anywhere with True any that, piece of software. True that. So who cares? I mean, it's nice. People who like KDE use KDE. It's great. This isn't really a knock against KDE. I agree. Why don't we talk about, uh, remember how I said there's not these mythical users that just pop out of nowhere that have never used a computer before and all of a sudden are using Linux? Yeah. Well, except for in India where Ubuntu <laughs> adoption has grew 160% in the last year. Yeah. Uh, Canonical says they are seeing tremendous opportunity in India. Awesome. Um, and this makes sense. Now, because of the price, because of the different, just, just the cost of Ubuntu alone, which is free, and then them partnering with a company like Canonical and Canonical partnering with a hardware vendor and then be able to come down there and say, okay, we'll give you the support, we'll give you the software, and here's a hardware vendor we've handpicked. They'll work with you too. That's great. They've seen a ton of success with this approach. Uh, so, I mean, 160% from what? I don't know, but I still think it's really awesome. And I just wanted to throw that story in there since I did just get on my high horse about how it does kind of frustrate me that we keep building these desktops toward these new users who... Don't really seem like they exist in our world, but they are actually out there. They totally exist. They are in the room. They totally exist. All right, B-Man, this one is a riveting story. I just want to give it a quick plug. <laughs> I love this story. Uh, Fedora <laughs> is considering for the next version to up it from Turbo Lib JPEG to including 256 colors yeah, on the cool. command line. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? What do you think, B-Man? You... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't really care. Now, this, of course, was debated during uh, the OpenStack uh, meeting that they had where they were trying to really discuss the best direction to take this. And, of course, the members agreed that while they couldn't come to, an, to some sort of arrangement they all agreed upon for this very controversial topic, uh, they will revisit the matter uh, and have another debate so now, on the mailing now list. Now, there are already... Uh, terminals that you can get that have much larger color palettes and there it is there are ways within yeah. non 256 color enabled yeah. x terms to run applications yeah. inside the terminal that use many more colors than that it's yeah. just a matter of making the terminal itself 256 color yeah um and it kind of like really i mean have you ever sat around and thought, man, if only I had a few more colors? I mean, it's it's just, it doesn't happen all that much. But uh, I think it's totally fine. Yeah. I have no issue with it. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, but so Mac OS 10 did it in the last release. Yeah. Um, they they basically just, just revved did up it, to the latest version. Was it version. revolutionary? Was, did it just... I don't even think they mentioned it. And uh, now we've know. revolutionized the terminal by enabling 256 well, just, colors. I mean, they just grabbed it from FreeBSD. I mean, <laughs> FreeBSD had it, and so they grabbed it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't even know if Apple engineers knew no. that they grabbed it. Like, oh, crap, did you... I mean, because nope. you can't tell by just looking yeah, at it. You'd yeah. have to actually run yeah. software at specific... Anyway, so so it kind of seems like the Fedora people are like, oh, Mac OS we 10 can do, can do more colors in the terminal than we can? We better keep up. We better keep up. I mean... I mean, luckily, Mac OS X didn't come up with, like, accelerated animated GIF support or something like that. Because right. then, boo, whoa, boo. Whoa, whoa. But who cares? It, it's, it's fine. I mean, why not? Speaking More is better, right? Speaking of distributions that believe in the more is better in terms of version numbers, we talked about them before, and the outlook was a little foggy, but things have turned around, B-Man, because I've got good news. <laughs> a new version of Slackware is in development. Version 14.0 is underway. And I just wanted to include this in here because we did talk about at one point that the Slackware project, their website was down. Yeah. They're having a hard time. I remember the developer was like, 
So what if the website's down, the FTP site's up? Well, what's the big deal? It's freaking Slackware. I mean, come on. This isn't like Nike. They're not selling like consumer-level shoes here. It's freaking Slackware. The only ways you're going to get it are from the repositories, uh, from the source code repository or FTP site. Because mm-hmm. it's freaking Slackware. And giving KDE a huge vote of confidence, Slackware has announced that they will be shipping KDE 4.84 in version 14 of Slackware, as well as Linux kernel 3.2.21. And don't forget, you're also going to get your GCC 4.7.1 and Python 2.7.3. Here's the only problem I have. So Slackware, their last their last release was Leet. Yes. One three three yes. seven. Right. The current the new release is going to be 14.0. I feel like there's got to be a better, more awesome yeah. hacker speak yeah. number that they right. could have used. Like, I like almost they, feel like it doesn't even matter wh- yeah. if the number is bigger or yeah. smaller. I feel like they just have to come yeah. up with a really cool what, one. How did you spell boobs on the calculator? Yeah, Remember in it's, school? It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 80085. That's what their or, next, yeah. that's what their next version number should be. Oh, that would be epic. <laughs> I know, right? You know what? If I come out Dude, that's what I'm doing. So, uh, so that, that's totally what I'm doing. So I've got I'm putting out my own little distro. It's not for consumer people. Oh, here rap. we go. This is no, 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 hold on. This, this is a, didn't make the distro round. No, no, no. Well, this is this is an un, I don't want I don't need people using this. So I'm just putting this little distro oh, okay. up on SUSE Studio and SUSE yeah. Gallery to make it easier for people who want to build my software, so who want to work with me on it and that sort of thing. And so yeah, cool. I should totally do that. I should make the version number boobs. boobs. <laughs> And just make it always boobs.1. <laughs> there boobs you go. Two. Speaking of Sousa. Boobs.3. I think we got to do our review next week because the <gasps> Monday or Tuesday after that. When it gets that, really good, boobs.boobs. Point boobs. <laughs> Nice, dude. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so uh, next Sunday, I think, is going to need to be the big show's review of open of the new OpenSUSE because it comes out like the Monday or Tuesday after that. Yeah. So we'll grab like the, the latest we'll snapshot, the, the stable that they put. The, the almost pretty much essentially yep. final. And we'll give it a go and uh, see, where we, see, where, uh, see where we stand. So tune in next week on the next action show. Oh, that'd be for that. All right, B-Man. Epic. So uh, we're going to talk about the Raspberry Pi. We got the Pi. Um, here's a box for the Pi, and here's the Pi itself, which is semi-transparent. You can kind of see clouds behind it. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that is. Because it's a green screen. That is pretty That's cool. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think that's all the news. I, I, I don't want any more news. I hate news right now. Oh, for this week. Me and news. <laughs> Done. Angry. Mad at the news. Brian's back this week, and he came with a new toy, his Raspberry Pi. Of course, everybody knows what the Raspberry Pi is, this tiny little Linux computer that is smaller than a deck of cards. Smaller. Yeah, it's it's really powerful. It's got Ethernet on it. It's got two USB ports, HDMI, and then it's got a R- RCA video RCA out, video. and then a mini audio jack out. Yep. And then on the bottom of this thing, the uh, SD card reader. Yeah. Which is very well hidden. It's very well hidden. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic little rig. I mean, it's it's if people people have been freaking about this for a while because it's friggin' like thirty five bucks for an ARM based desktop computer. Now it's green, so it, it keys out on our green screen if you're watching the video version. But you can still get the relative size of it. So you haven't had a ton of time to play with it, but you got no, a chance I've to got kick a, our tires a little bit. Right? I've had a little bit of time to play with it. I threw <laughs> Debian Squeeze on here to kind of get a gauge for general performance, and I uh, managed to throw a few key applications on here to see how things went. Yeah, and. and uh, I love this little rig. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to take this from the top. Okay. Um, first, first of all, I ran a little contest uh, about a month back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, something, do something and get yeah, some pie. Yeah, yeah. Right? Build something cool and win, and win some pie. Uh, so I actually have two of these guys, and I'm going to give one away to the, the winner of that contest in the next week or so. Uh, but this one is mine, and I'm not letting anyone touch it because it's <laughs> mine, and I love this one. <laughs> but seriously, for 35 bucks, it is an amazing deal. Honestly, for more than 35 bucks, I don't know that it's that good a deal. Really? So now here's the, th- really? here's the thing with this guy. Whoa, really? It is very, very fast for running one thing at a time. Um, but what you're looking at here is really a machine that you can't expand the memory of. It, you have a set amount of RAM. Mm, true. And it's not much. And when you're talking about multitasking, let, let's say open up a web browser with a whole slew of tabs, you've seen how slow a 2 gig of RAM system can yeah, get yeah. when you open up uh, Chromium with more than five or six tabs. Sure. Same issue on this little guy. You're going to bog your system down. But if you want a great little set top box for your TV... 
or you want a machine that's really great at running one, maybe two things at a time, this thing is stellarly good. And you may ask yourself, well, what is that good for? So I've been doing a little brainstorming and I played around with the performance of different applications. And here's kind of what I've come to. Throwing the, the default sock Debian Squeeze, which ships with LXDE, which is, you know, it's very lightweight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, Midori Web Browser ships with it by default, which is a great lightweight choice. It all works pretty well. It's like using an old netbook. It's like using the yeah, old like that. triple E PCs, the original ones that shipped. It's not terribly fast, yeah. but it's fast enough for compute day-to-day -day right. computing purposes if you could. And I um, recall, didn't they put, isn't there a chip on there uh, that's supposed to make HD playback yes. a little more slick? So I, I didn't try it with full 1080p, but I tried it with 720 and there was no issues whatsoever. Nice. So I was able to play back 720 uh, X vids nice. with no problem at all, um, and it ran incredibly, incredibly well. So, and of course, silent, which is a neat little dead you know, silent. You wouldn't even no know fan. it's on, right? There's no fan. There's no moving parts. There's nothing on this. Yeah. So I plugged this into into my TV through the little HDMI port. Plugged it into the TV. Uh, plugged you know USB and mouse into it. Uh, it's powered via the little micro USB. Oh, on the side. okay. I was wondering. So uh, it's a little micro USB. Now, it didn't ship with... I got mine from uh, Element 14 uh, out of uh, Great Britain, and uh, there's one of the two manufacturers right, of right, it. Right. And it doesn't. It did not come with a power adapter. Now, I think you can pay more, and they'll give you one. But I already have so many things. Like, like my, your gadgets. My little Nokia N900 already had a micro U mm -hmm. USB, so I already used that for charging. So I just tried that out. It worked just fine. Yeah, I like that. Um, now, so I plugged this into my TV. Wow, that really tells you... That tells you the scale of this thing, that it can run off of a micro USB power source. Yeah, quite, quite well. So I, then I plugged it into my TV, loaded up Debian Squeeze on it, and it boots pretty <laughs> fast. Like, yeah. I mean, it's not exactly like, oh my gosh, five seconds and it's loaded. It, no, it takes a little while. But, yeah, we but have a video here. It, I was watching this guy's video of it. and it's It like, does not take like 10 minutes or anything to no, boot, but, but it, it boots up pretty fast. It, yeah. Uh, fast enough. And let's be honest, like if you're building this as a set-top box or anywhere you go, you don't need it to boot in 10 minutes. It's in, in 10 seconds. It, you know, a minute is just fine. And wow. really, it takes less Look than that. Look at this. Uh, Shane Kufel in the chat room says, uh, and Shane, Shane, by the way, is the guy that does our Jupiter Broadcasting app in the Android market. He says, it works great on my 40-inch TV, 1080p. I actually watched the live stream on it through the XBMC Jupiter Broadcasting app. See? This is what I'm talking oh. about. Now, now, granted, if he'd tried to do that while at the same time, say, loading up Eclipse right. and you know, 12 tabs in Firefox, you're going <laughs> to die a slow death. Uh, but one thing at a time, it's going to handle it fine. It's going to be able to accelerate the video just fine. It has enough juice to do anything you need there just fine. I also loaded up a lot of emulators on this. Oh, cool. I threw DOSBox on here, you know, a couple of console emulators that I had legal ROMs for. Um, and, you know... And so I got the little USB ports. Yeah. Plugged in my Xbox 360 controllers. No. Plugged this into the HDMI into the TV. I guess, you know, they're all re that's, they're just relying on the support in Linux. And they're supporting Linux, and it works just fine. A little bit of configuration for the for the for keys. Yeah. Sat back, butter smooth emulation. Oh, butter smooth, of, huh? I mean, butter smooth, just, just, just like an Android. Style, yeah, huh? Project Butter Style. Yeah, Project Butter Style, yeah. Of great old games. So as... Here's the cool part. And I was okay. able to load this all on a, a little 8 gig SD card that I just shoved in there. I just had one that you can, right. I mean, come on, you can pick up an 8 gig SD card seriously, for like 10 bucks. Seriously. So I shoved that in there. And an 8 gig SD card is main, maybe not going to fit your entire video collection, but you can fit a lot of video games well, on there. you got an Ethernet port on that thing. If you got your video you got on an your Ethernet port. home server. That's, that's what I did. So I loaded that up, pointed it over to my server. Nice. Done. And it worked remarkably well. Um, now, again, that's just one thing at a time, though. As soon as I tried to do more than, you know, two or three things at once, really especially it? if it's intensive, oh, man, do you, do you feel it. Do you feel like that was all memory restriction? I think it was memory restriction, yeah. So if but, they I mean, came out really, with a newer model that had, like... But really, I mean, it's... It is not, uh, you know, a, a quad core, yeah. two gigahertz, yeah. you know, processor. Right. Here. It's an ARM chip. And it kind of made me start thinking about my older N900 phone. Right, right. Because, I mean, really, we're looking at something kind of similar in a way. You know, a nice ARM chip, a decent amount of RAM for, for the size and what it is. And really, we're looking at similar size. I mean, and in fact, the Raspberry Pi is a little bit smaller than my Nokia N900 yeah. phone. Isn't that crazy? Um, and, uh, and, and has more power than it to be sure. I mean, this is capable of, of running a lot more and crunching a lot more numbers. Um, 
Now, once you put a case on this, you're going to have to build it yourself if you want one. Uh, you're going to start looking at it. It'll be a little bit bigger than this, which brings me to the next topic I yeah. want to talk about. Cases for this thing, huh? Cases. Uh, flop me over here. Um, and this is what I've decided I'm going to do. I'm going to go the that Lego case That sounds really route. weird to the audio listeners who have no idea. I just changed it to your computer screen. It changed it to my computer Flop screen. me over here. and they're Flop just me over here. You know, they, don't, they don't know what you're they talking don't know about. What. Yeah. <laughs> well, they should be watching the video version so they can get all this. So here's, here's one of the Lego cases. Let me see if I can scroll up so you can see all of this. So you can see here, basically, people are just like, you know what? Let's build a case that fits this machine out of pure Legos. That's, that's just and a great. lot of people are doing this. And here's here's in instructions on how to build this case complete with and i'll scroll all the way by down the way here, on the raspberry pi site on the raspberry pi website yeah yeah uh with with a little raspberry pi logo that sits on top of it all in legos and here's another one uh and uh, let me see if i can zoom in here a little bit here that looks a little bit more hardcore oh yeah yeah and you can get a lot of these and honestly a lego case is kind of a nice it's, way to go it's funny how much more that looks like to a regular that looks more like a regular computer to me. now if you look at the shot you think oh that looks kind of big and bulky but then uh, think about it here we're talking about like this yeah so you're really only talking of a machine that's a, a couple of inches wide, basically uh, at most about six inches by about uh, two and a half yeah, inches tall. Three, yeah. it, it's, it's not too bad. It's you're, you're talking really, really small. And the nice part about this is this thing just does not get hot. Right. And it just doesn't it doesn't right. need a fan. Right. So throwing it in a Lego case no, biggie. no big friggin' deal. You're not gonna have to worry about the plastic it's like, melting it's all like over my your desk. Or something. And 386 where I didn't even have to have a fan. Yeah. Now a lot of you are like, oh man, I wish I could get one of these for thirty five bucks and use some of my old Lego parts from when I was a kid, but I don't have them anymore because my wife made me get rid of them all and I'm very, very sad about that. Go down to your Lego store. They have walls of Legos. Yeah. They have parts here for people that have already figured out how to do this and, and, and put instructions on for the case they built. If you want to just clone one of those, get the part so they, list, get, go to the Lego store, spend 5 nice, to $10, and nice. get your Lego parts. Or there's lots of that. Lego designing applications out there that yeah. let you design the case. So you could put in... The, the build the case visually in 3D and then it'll give you a list of Lego parts print it out go to the store a couple of bucks so that's what I'm going to be doing with this guy and then what I'll have is and I'll put an 8 or 16 gig SD card here in the in the final thing and then what I'll have is a great gaming rig now check this out a great little, multiplayer little emulator rig. rig check out this uh, link from the chat room there uh, from yes. Geek uh, this is uh, this is a pre-built case that comes uh this one's red, but I would assume they'd have other colors too. This actually looks kind of slick. It looks super slick. And it's so there's lots and lots of options out there. There's going to be a whole cases market for this. There's going to be a cases market for this. There totally is. And kind of what I was thinking about this, and I'm like, well, where do you use this? I mean, where does this really come in handy? And realistically, honestly, everywhere. So at the price, I don't see a reason to limit yourself to just one. Right. So, so here's what I started you deciding for all kinds when of I things. like this. So currently, uh, my home TV is either my Xbox or my PlayStation, right? Okay. I have a boxy and I, box. On and my... you have a boxy box. But, you know, I, I'm like, well, you know, I have these game consoles anyway that I've had for a long time now. I might as well use them to play my digital content yeah, and all that yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. But really, it's overkill. They're loud. Yeah. They suck a ton of, power. ton of power. They're not customizable. Right. A lot of times they don't support weird and codecs and don't play OG the files. The vendors keep updating them in a way that make them actually in some ways less and less usable as... Exactly. Yeah. And for me, I'm a classic <clears throat> gamer, right? So I like to play weird OG files, yeah. those crazy OG files that no one's ever heard what? of. I like to play classic games. I like to do all these things. I'm like, well, and, and honestly, I like to be able to do maybe a little web browsing, check my yeah. email. Yeah, a little porn. Here's, here's something little throw at you. Get one of these. Mm -hmm. Put some Legos around it, or hell, stick it in a static bag <laughs> with some cables going into it. I know okay. it's ridiculous, but why not? Okay. Stick it behind your TV. It's so small. You can mount this anywhere. No one's ever going to see it. Yeah. Now, you got two USB ports coming out of it. There's no wireless by default, so you're going to have to get some Ethernet to it, or you need one of those little USB to wireless dongles, yeah. which there's lots of. The problem is you've only got two USB ports without using uh -huh. a hub. Yeah. So you're going to have to try and be a little creative about it. But let's say you want to hook this up to your TV. Some interesting options to go here. All right. You know those little wireless, super tiny remote keyboards? Yeah, yeah. With the little trackpads on yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. 
They have a little little dongle. You stick right in there. Uh-huh. They have about a 15 foot range on there. That'd be great. Perfect. Stick that behind the TV. Mm-hmm. Plug in. Uh, you can do the same thing with controllers. Stick in a little Xbox 360 controller, which mm-hmm. you don't need to buy an Xbox for, just because the 360 controller is just a good controller with a long cable. Go grab it. Plug it in. You now have a nice keyboard. Yeah. And a nice game controller for playing classic games, doing web browsing, doing whatever you want on your home TV. You know, and the thing is, though, you're going to end up spending significantly more on peripherals than you would on yeah. the machine and the it's case true, itself. True, the peripherals cost more. You know, Way more. you could almost make a business out of this. Here's a case. We, we mount it to the back of your TV. Yeah. Uh, run these cords to it, and it's it's an entertainment system. And you know, like my TV, uh, both both my upstairs and downstairs TV have a USB port on them for like updates. Yeah. So you could probably pull the power from that USB port into this thing. Yeah. And then you just. Yeah. By the way, you can. So I pulled power off of uh, one of my laptops. One of my well, I'm gonna be honest, off of my Triple E that runs my BBS. I pulled a USB off of that because I have a little USB to to micro USB. Powered this baby just fine. Nice. Now I don't know how well that would. Go once I started adding peripherals to this that also need power, that might be too much for Whoa, it. I check. might have to get an actual jack. This this site is, uh, you go there and you add these and they do 3D printing for these cases. Look at this case. This is like some sort of industrial strength pipe. Oh, it's mm. plastic when you... Yeah, but come on. Still though, I mean, glorious. This, this whole site has a whole list of them. Yep, there's tons of Raspberry Pi case designs out there. There's, uh, I've seen people building wooden I like cases, this one. which honestly, the idea of having like a hand whittled wooden case is glorious. Look how Maybe good that looks. Look, so and this- small as hell on the screen. There, it's significantly bigger than it would be in real life. Yeah. That's that's the crazy thing to me. And yes, this guy is not terribly powered. Terribly powerful. No, it really isn't. But it's Rev One. I mean, eventually, you know, the thing is about the mass production of Android phones and stuff is these quad core processors are going to come to these cheaper devices. Right now, this really doesn't need to be any no, more powerful. No, no. So, so, so I started thinking about that. There's one use of this guy that I am going to be using this for. So this is going to replace my TV. This one right here is going to be my new TV box. Well, what if you're the kind of guy that you know comes home and then he goes to work in the morning, he goes sits down at his desk. Well. Typically, people bring along their tablets, their laptops, etc. They can bring their their music collections with them. Yeah, that would be stellar on one of these. This would rock to be able to have a full desktop environment that you can oh, go yeah. to work with. Oh yeah. And here's the thing. So let's bring your desktop with you. Kinda? Let's bring your full desktop with you. You don't have to worry about making sure you erase your browser history. No. You don't have to worry well, about like, making sure your 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 music is I've not a, on the corporate like, desktops. When I've had Just a put work, it on here. When I've had a work laptop. You know, what do I always do with that work laptop? I bring it into my desk, I sit down, if it's got a docking station, or if it doesn't, I hook up the monitor and the yep. keyboard, and I got an external mouse and keyboard whenever You do I'm, that anyway. Yeah. You do that anyway. Yeah. So why not make it super, super small? Get one of those tiny little mice. You know, those little laptop mice yeah, that are crazy like tiny. It travels like crazy small. Um, use right a, here, use a keyboard that you already have at work or uh, bring another one in and just sit down, plug it in, yeah. stick it into a monitor with the HDMI like, cable, which most modern monitors this set, have. right here, this, this set is a mouse and keyboard set that use one micro USB dongle. Perfect. One micro wireless USB yeah. dongle. You're still one more dongle free mm-hmm. and, and you're good to go. Now, if you don't, if you have a monitor that doesn't have an HDMI port, getting an HDMI to DVI cable is not that bad. Uh, you can go over to a bunch of different websites and get a little little uh, cable to, to handle that just there fine. You go. So really, really, I haven't found a lot this couldn't do. Um, hmm. Now, I, I tried to use this to compile some of my software. Worked just fine. If I tried to do that while I was, say, browsing three different tabs on the website, I would have cried and, and, and just <laughs> immediately thrown this out a window. But as long as I know the limitations. It's pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. Now, here's another thing I was thinking of. Make it job specific. You're all right. Make it job specific. You're totally fine. This also works great for an installation piece. So if you have uh, an office and you want to put running demos up, you mount this to the back yeah. of a monitor, a flat screen, put the flat yeah. screen up and don't have cables going anywhere right. and you can just run whatever you want right. off of it. Pretty pretty awesome. Yeah. So honestly, I think this is fantastic. I, I've been thinking about this kind of long and hard about what I would Could change about this. Could make a really cool this. little file server too. Super. You know, you had attached to like a Drobo or a free NAS or some sort of some sort of external NAS attached uh-huh. storage. Stick it in the US- USB port. USB is only so fast, but if that's okay for you, that's well. Come on, USB is probably plenty fast, unless you're doing lots of video editing. Work. Yeah. I mean, yeah. or unless you're moving around, you know, eighty gig files. Yeah. yeah. It's probably going to be plenty right, fast. I mean, hell, go crazy, go iSCSI and just do it over the Ethernet. What's up? Go crazy. Dude, you could. You could. You totally could. Mm-hmm. So. 
it really is pretty fast. It really is pretty great. And, you know, this got me thinking, those are all great, legit uses of sure, this. Sure, sure. What about the other uses of this? What are we going to do? So I started thinking. Prank somebody with a Raspberry Pi somehow? <laughs> you got a prank or what? You can get really great batteries out there that oh, you yeah? can that you can you know have that have little micro yep. usb things yep. the idea is to you know to charge your cell phone yep. on the go yep so you have little tiny battery packs to power this on the go you get little wireless dongles so you could have in a very very small pack a very powerful little linux device mm -hmm. very powerful with ethernet with wi-fi War driving, you thinking? I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking more than war driving. Okay. I'm thinking stuff. I mean, we're talking like mount this to a remote controlled car, stream back the video off of it, and then war drive off of that. That would be pretty wild. I mean, I mean the 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 uses for this guy are, you've heard are things almost like, unlimited you've heard because like, it's so small, so low powered, light, light and light. I mean, you've heard like the guys at Pirate Bay talking about taking things like this and striping the drones and then putting them up in the air. Exactly. Or go, yeah, go to the the sharper image and get those mm -hmm. little those little four <laughs> four blade drones. This is so light, guys. It's yeah. so it's only a couple of ounces. Yeah. You stick that on there. That thing's gonna fly just fine as long as you don't stick it like on the edge or something. Yeah. And why not? Yeah. Why the frig not? And for thirty five bucks, put a USB bucks, webcam on that thing, and then <laughs> thirty five bucks for the Ethernet version. We'll get the non Ethernet version if you're already flying this in the air. You're probably not going to use Ethernet for twenty five bucks. So just save yourself ten bucks yeah. that you can put towards I don't know a bunch of cool Lego parts. That's funny. It's just so cool. Chat room's I, like, here, what about something like this? You could do something like this. They got a link to this. Uh, that's the thing. Like just fill so up so many device. ideas. Yeah. So many ideas, and that's what I like about this. Is it? It puts the fun back in it, you know? Like, it puts the fun into tinkering around with having a computer again. Yeah. Because so many times now, we buy, we buy a Lenovo laptop, and we're done. You know? Mm -hmm. Like, System76 makes great desktops, but you buy it from them, and you're done. They're mature now. They're mature. They're not like back in the day where you had to, like, assemble parts, this, and you had though, to, yeah. But this. Dude, you, computers used to have a turbo button on them. I miss my turbo button. This is crazy. You could put a turbo button on this. It doesn't have to do anything. This is going to be an interesting thing to watch because while it's it's got a set processor now, you got to figure these parts are going to get a lot cheaper and a lot cheaper. A lot cheaper. I and mean, this is a great upgrade over time. And the schematics are are free for people to do stuff. This with. is a great uh, f playing field for Linux to get its ARM support really badly. Not that it's not already great. And, and if you look if you look down here, you can see all the all the LED buttons. You can't really see it too well on the on the screenshot. Let me see. I have a. Uh, uh, here we go. Here we go. Here's a, if you switch over to my yep. screen here, Chris, you can see basically the little schematics here. And up here you have the LEDs. And the LEDs, you know, show your your power has an okay light because things are okay. You know, your your whether or not you have an Ethernet link and all Let's that good stuff. There, there you go. There you go. Um, but what's really really cool about all this is you've got GPIO pins. So if you yeah. want to do some really cool stuff, you can. Uh, you have a lot of flexibility here. I mean, in a way, it's kind of like having a, an incredibly souped-up Arduino board because you can program a lot of stuff with this. I mean, if you're willing to get down and dirty, you can go crazy or, hell, interface this with another Arduino board, with an actual Arduino board, hmm. and do stuff with it. So it's, And control it. <laughs> and, con and control it from... I mean, which would be ridiculous and redundant, but <laughs> super, super cool. I, I really can't say enough good stuff about it. However, do not buy it if you're thinking, this is my desktop oh, now. Yeah, yeah. You will be so... So disappointed. If you're thinking, I want this to replace my my TV, my game console, my music player box. I mean, seriously, get you can oh get. Oh my gosh, I know what I'm going to use one. You for. can get little tiny HDMI displays. You can't. You can get them. Yeah. Little tiny ones. You yeah. can even get HDMI touch screens right. that take a USB. So get a little tiny one, HDMI, USB. Have this play your video for or your audio for your whole house. Yeah, it becomes totally. your your audio stereo exactly. system. Exactly. What, what are you going to use it for? Well, uh, I, I need a device, and I actually have a little Atom board I was thinking about using, but I need to, to send audio around the, between my office studio and this studio, and I use uh, a Shoutcast stream. There you go. And uh, Or an Icecast stream, actually. And uh, this would be a perfect little ice cast machine because it doesn't take very much CPU. Awesome, it doesn't take right? very much memory. And I, the very thing I want is something that's not going to add a lot of noise and something that won't add any uh, like fan noise and something that won't add heat to a studio. Awesome, right? Yeah. Super awesome. Or hell, <clears throat> get a copy of Synchronet BBS server. There you go. Recompile it because it'll compile on ARM. There's people that have done work on that. Put it on one of these bad boys for 35 bucks. You throw in a 4 gig SSD card. Boom. Boom. You can have your own dedicated, say, 100 line BBS server running off of the palm of your hand and just stick it somewhere and forget it because it makes no noise and takes almost no power. Oh. 
All right. So many options. So, uh, look, here's the thing is when you have devices like these or devices like these, they are portable, they're mobile, you can lose them, right? I you, guess. You get lost. Also, you know, if you have a Linux laptop, <laughs> and I, I one time almost crapped my pants, I left a laptop that I was being really lazy and I didn't have it locked when the screensaver came on because I was working on this project and I was just, and I was stepping away, coming back, stepping away, coming back. And I left the client with my laptop there. And of course, I had client data on Oof. it. I couldn't remember though Oof. if I'd left it there or if I'd left it somewhere else, like at the office. It's rough. And so, this is where a piece of software called Prey would have been awesome. And that's what Matt's going to talk about in his how to segment, which is brought to you by System76. They hooked us up with a wild dog performance machine. No. Dude. No. They hooked Matt up. Yeah. Matt. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll tell you, he was Skyping in last week from his wild dog with the new version of Skype and an HD webcam, one of the best remote pictures I've ever, I'd ever seen. I, uh, so uh, thank you to System76 for uh, Taking that guy down. the how-to segment. Me and Matt, we're going to go mano a mano. And whoever wins takes the wild dog. Whoever wins takes the friggin' wild dog. <laughs> you better wait till you're a little healthier, though. Yeah, I, yeah. he would kick my butt yeah. so bad right now. All right, so let's toss let's it to Matt. Honest, he's going to kick my butt no matter what. Brian, Matt. I, I am so puny. My arms have, like, no muscles Brian, on. Brian, Matt. Hey everyone, have you ever thought to yourself, oh no, what if my laptop gets stolen or oh, someone broke into my home and potentially stole my computer tower with all my state secrets on it or something you know, equally important or maybe even your mobile phone? Did you know that there is actually web-based software that can help? And I say web-based in that all the action happens on the web. However, there is actually a local client that will run on Android, that will run on Ubuntu, and uh, it installs relatively simple. Um, the first thing I'm going to show you is actually how it works. So we're going to watch a video just real quick, giving you a quick little rundown as to what this looks like when this guy installs it on a Mac. And you can see the installation is fairly simple. You get some emails about what's going on and so on and so forth. Basically, it's going to give you a location of the where the laptop last reports in, uh, sc uh, actual webcam snapshots of the person that ganked your uh, laptop, which is pretty cool. But um, I actually, just because I, you know, reading about it, one thing, watching videos on it's one thing, but to actually experience it is a very different. I actually signed up for the pro service to see what this would look like. And I did so with the uh, uh, Wild Dog Performance PC. And of course, this is just for this segment. I've obviously uninstalled it since then. And it is open source software, so I'm not concerned about being rootkitted or any conspiracy theory type stuff in that respect. It's perfectly safe. So it's uh, running well at this moment. It's set up as okay because I happen to have this in uh, in a safe location. I know that it's with me. I know it's safe. It's uh, perfectly okay. And as you can see, the reports, if you do report it stolen, are fairly straightforward. Let's go ahead and jump right into that. Now, before we get into the reports, though, I want to kind of show you what a control panel looks like for a pro user. This is pretty cool. Uh, you know, again, you know, is it? Missing, yes, no, save changes, pretty simple. Go ahead and bounce that back. Uh, the activation mode, how frequently do I want it to check? Do I want it to do it on an interval or do I want it to do it on demand? On demand and interval, basically the difference there is that I'm saying if I do it on demand, it will. I can report it stolen, but nothing will actually take place until I've actually clicked on uh, save changes and then run, run prey, which is right here. So if I was to actually do that, it would, in fact, run it on this computer, which I'm not going to do just because it's not needed. Now, all that being said, it's not perfect. There are some things that didn't work. Uh, jumping out of this and actually showing you a screenshot of what did work, and then I'll cover what didn't work. Let me do that right now. <clears throat> Okay, so I actually took a screenshot of this because I didn't want to obviously uh, divulge where I live and all that sort of stuff. I want to keep some, you know, a bit of privacy there. So I blurred some things out, but it gives you an idea what that looks like. What it does effectively for an Ubuntu user is I found that it does a good job with providing a very, really very accurate uh, location based based on uh, wireless triangulation uh, with a notebook as to where you're at. And it does it very uh, in a very stealth kind of way. Uh, you really wouldn't know what was going on unless you knew what to look for. It's very cool. And if you have a webcam attached, it will actually capture you quite nicely. In addition to that, it will provide the MAC address, uh, the gateway private IP, as well as the remote IP. So you can see exactly where they're at, what's going on, um, which system it is, and so on and so forth. But with all this information, this is stuff that you can actually then turn over to the police if your stuff is stolen and say, look, I've got an image of this guy. He ripped off my laptop. What are we going to do about it? You know, that kind of stinks. Now, there unfortunately are some things on the Ubuntu side of it that did not work as expected. And this hopefully will be uh, 
working in the future because it really bummed me out that it didn't work for me. The first thing I found that didn't work for me, although I did follow the instructions for Linux users as far as uh, I think it was installing MP3, 123, and that sort of thing, was the alarm function. That did not work. Um, even with speak, even with everything set up properly, it, it just simply wasn't working. Uh, the biggest issue that I had is that the alert feature did not work. So you have alarm, you have alert. These these you know these features did not work at all. Um, that really bummed me out because on other platforms you can actually have it spit up a message like old Windows Messenger style saying, "Hey, dude, you stole my laptop. Uh, you need to give it back to me." Or potentially, "Hey, this laptop was found on accident. Can you re uh, return it to so and so?" Actually, to broadcast that on your device itself is rather important and of course you can insert whatever information you want here but this is their suggested uh, message to send also the changing of the wallpaper this is awesome because you can actually change the wallpaper to reflect the fact that the laptop is in fact stolen um, it's real hard to be stealth at a coffee shop when your wallpaper is locked in as hey this is a stolen laptop warning you know that sort of thing kind of a big deal uh, so the other so the other issue is then, of course, the locking mechanism. This was a deal breaker for me as far as uh, wanting to uh, stick with the pro setup. I'll probably use this still, but I would more than likely use it as the free setup because I can't get the locking mechanism to work. There is an option to uh, lock up the computer so that if someone did, in fact, steal it, you know, they can't even – once they've logged out, they can't get back into it. And that, of course, is with the understanding that you have the guest account set up, and I'll show you the configuration for that. Um, because obviously for any of this to be effective and for it to log in, you obviously would need to have them log in so that you can get a picture of them and uh, get a, an idea where they're at. The last option that really kind of uh, let me down was the secure option. Um, this may I've read this works for some Linux users, but I didn't have success with it. And that's basically where it's going to go through and clean out all the files and uh, your browser history and anything of importance that might have your banking information. Uh, perhaps it's a documents folder with something. All, all the different things of whatever you set it up to uh, clean out. And it says here on the uh, actual display, hides emails deletes browser cookies and stored passwords for all accounts on your computer, preventing access to unauthorized users. It is also warning you to only do that if you are absolutely sure you're wanting to do that because you can't get it back, of course, if you do that. But based on my experience, that did not work. Now, jumping back once again to what did work, I did find that the webcam option worked really well. I was really happy to see that because honestly, that would have been a real issue for me if you couldn't at least get a snapshot of the guy who ripped you off. Uh, geolocation worked well. Uh, the network stuff here, which is basically the detail, you know, basically detailed network information such as your IP address, local and otherwise. Um, da -da 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 -da. Oh, and of course, you can get uh, Wi-Fi with nearby hotspots. I found that to work as well. Trace route worked. Um, all that good stuff. Screenshot did not work, unfortunately. But um, and uh, not to worry. The long list of what worked and what didn't work for Ubuntu users. I'll make sure that's in the show notes. Suffice it, suffice it to say, it's very cool, but I think that it's. Uh, Needs a little work. Um, again, it's really, really good at actually producing something that you can, again, see where the computer is and actually see who stole it, and that's cool, but I'm not entirely sure that I'm going to recommend going with a pro account just yet. It's it's neat, but I'm not sure it's quite there yet. It's an open source project, so it's bound to develop over time, and, you know, I might personally continue to give them some cash based on the subscription model in the hopes that they will fix these features because honestly that would be really awesome i'm really happy with that so let's go ahead and actually look at the configuration here and bear in mind this is from the deb package that is provided from their website and not from the one in the software center listen to me carefully the software center package that comes with ubuntu 1204 is basically a shell script and so if you want the uh, actual you know, GUI experience, make sure to grab the latest 5.3 release of Prey. So we got the dialog box with all installed up here, and you can see everything's here. So basically, the options are pretty simple. Um, just out of the box, if you want a frequency of reported actions, you know, I, I like 10 minutes. That seems pretty good. You'll want to make absolutely sure you're enabling the guest account. And of course, the Wi-Fi auto connect. Um, it's not mandatory, but it is helpful. Um, if they happen to be running with Wi-Fi offline, it's nice to know that it's still going to connect so you can see what's going on. Now, that being said, once you've made your changes uh, there, you're going to want to pop into the reporting mode. I'm a big believer in sticking with recommended settings unless you know what you're doing. 
I, there's no, no compelling reason for most people to mess with these settings here at all under reporting mode. Leave it at prey and control panel. That's what I would do. And, of course, you can then process through and go forward into uh, the other goodies and actually finish that installation process. But once you're all done, you can hit apply, and your configuration is saved. And then, of course, you can pop back into uh, Prey and actually see what you got. So that's really all there is to it. Low jack for your computer. It's cheap. I forget exactly how much I ended up paying for it. I think it was like five bucks or seven bucks or something like that a month. It was really, really cost effective. Um, the takeaways... Is it worth it to pay for it versus the free version? You know, I, you know, I, I, I think it is just because I want to see this develop. If, if having some security for your for your mobile device or your laptop and things like that are important, you can add more than one device uh, to Prey. You can actually, if you have an Android phone and a laptop, yeah, maybe paying for the uh, Pro Edition would be more worthwhile. Uh, Pro Edition also allows you to store up to 100 reports so that if your laptop is stolen – you're not going to lock in at whatever the default number of uh, reports are that it gives you for free. It's pretty minimal. At 100 for the pro level, I think that's really worthwhile. So definitely check it out. Um, and you can name it anything you want. It uh, has full control, full remote control on that whole thing. And assuming they get some of the stuff caught up on, I think it's going to be worth pursuing. So I will provide all that in the show notes. That is the Prey Project Lojack for your Ubuntu computer or Android device. That's all there is to it. Back to you guys. I would like to hear some feedback. All right, B-Man, we got three emails that came into the phone. You notice how I just ignored that Matt was just talking? Oh, yeah. I just ignored that sucker. Thanks, Matt. Forget that guy. All right. Forget that wild dog possessing man. Wow. Wow. But now you'll know how to track your machine if it ever gets stolen. I don't care. It's not a wild dog. Okay. All right. So feedback. First email comes in from Raven. He says, hey, Raven. He says, hi, guys. Hi. Uh, you really need to review Sabi Yaya 9. Like Sabian. 9, KDE edition. It's 100% better than all previous 100%? releases. 100%? I've actually that heard, is so many percent. I actually heard this from a few people. That's one of the reasons why I included this one. So, uh, well, next week, we're going to be talking about OpenSUSE, so we're not going to be talking about Sabion. Yeah. Uh, I'd be willing to put it on the list again. It's been a long time since we looked at it. It has been a long time. I think that. it was six or seven, maybe. All right. So, uh, Ray writes in B-Man. You ready for this? No. Okay. This is going to blow my mind. I'm a big fan of your show. Of course watching. he is. Yep. Of course you are, Ray. He's been watching. Next feedback. Okay. Uh, so yeah. the next uh, question comes. No. Uh, Ray wants to know a good way to uh, learn IT quick because his company's making some changes at, at Linux quick. He wants some ways to make learn Linux quick because his company's making changes in their IT department. Uh, so, Brian, do you have any tips for fast ways to learn Linux? Absolutely. If you've got three days, Gentoo. That's not bad. That's not bad. If you got three days, yeah. You know, put yourself through torture, and I, I know, I know. Uh, Gentoo is not torture once you know what you're doing. But if you don't know what you're doing, yeah. it's torture. Yeah. But it's three days of torture, and in the end, you yeah. will know what you're doing, yeah. or you won't, and you will realize that you should never touch a Linux. You day. might want to give yourself if you're going to do it like over a period of a few days. You might want to give yourself like. Five days if you're doing like in the evenings. Give yep. yourself some time. Give yourself some rewards. Be like, if I can actually compile some of this damn stuff, yeah, I get a brownie. The first time, if, the if first I, time it boots on its own. Yeah, I'm going. I'm, I'm I'm going to go out to pizza. Yeah, and I'm getting myself a giant pitcher of Dr Pepper. Yeah, because I deserve it. Like, yeah. just treat yourself nice those three days. Reward the hell out of yourself. And then in the end, you'll feel really good about it all. You'll have a working Gen 2 system where you'll feel like you screwed up a bunch of stuff, but you'll know what you screwed up. You'll know how to do it better the next time, and you'll know Linux well enough to, to do true. what you need to do. That's true. Uh, also, you know, keep watching podcasts. That's a good way to go. Really, it is. Or, or uh, some people are saying Slackware. I, uh, my, my recommendation is, is, really, really, yeah. is really Gen 2 is a you good way it. to get your... Your, your feet in the door like like some people would recommend going Arch or something like that but really with Arch there's a lot of stuff you can just miss because Arch does a great job of you know putting documentation together and you just could, kind of walking you through you, like you could actually make a course out of like you know okay class for the first few days we're going to do this portion of the, Ubuntu, of the Gen 2 installer yep. and then yeah 
All right, so last question isn't really a question. It's more of a recommendation. I, I've thought about doing this myself, so I loved it that uh, Peter sent this along. So Peter writes in, he says, Hi there, maybe a good tip for everyone. I recommend you get a SATA switch. You know, like, so you can actually physically, so you power off your machine, and you ch chunk, kind of old school, and you select the SATA drive you want to boot from. So you take power from one, you send power to another, yeah. and you actually are physically isolating your disk. So you could be like, okay, all right, I hit this button, and now it's my Windows drive. I hit this button, it's my it's, Linux machine. It's kind of cool to do. Yeah. yeah. I do I do this via the BIOS right now for my Hackintosh. I have I have Lion, Windows, and Ubuntu on there. Right. And I I could have gone this route, I guess. So, uh, yeah, so thank you to uh, Peter who this wrote that even, This would be even more secure because then the, those drives wouldn't even be connected anymore. He, yeah, that's what he goes on to say. Is he uses uh, one hard drive for banking, stocks, internet shopping, one hard drive for Linux daily use, one is just for testing Linux distros and BSD, and then uh, the fourth drive is for, for Windows, Windows testing. testing. That's, and if that's his a great Windows, way to go. And if his Windows machines gets totally mucked up with malware... It doesn't matter. It, Everything else is fine. Right. So, that's a good way to go. A good tip there. So uh, thanks, Peter. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Pitar. All right, B-Man. Well, folks, if you want to get a hold of us, you can go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and hit the contact link at the top of the page. We have a form over there now where you just select the show you want to send your feedback to, and it takes care of sending it to the right place and all that kind of stuff. So just find the contact button over there. And of course, while you're over there, visit the bottom of the site and use some of our affiliate links before you shop over at Amazon US, UK, Newegg, Think Geek, Best Buy, Mint.com, Audible. New thing we have, Code School. We are now an affiliate for Code School. God. Dude, have you seen it? Yeah, I've Code seen School it. is awesome. Check it out. Uh, Code School is, I don't know, I'm super impressed with it. But uh, they don't have courses on everything. Like Fortran. I don't believe they have courses on Fortran. Why no Fortran? I, I love Fortran. I've talked to them and they're going to add it. So click, go ahead and open up the Pascal course real quick. Okay. All right. Here, I'll, I'll give that while you. Why don't you plug something while I do that? Go to, go to Lundick.com. All right. All right. <laughs> well, then I can't open up the Pascal thing. My, my plugs nowadays are really easy. All my crap is open source. If you go to Lunduke.com, you can see it. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not like I need to come on here every day and be like, everybody, I have a brand new release. Yeah, there's new releases of stuff all the time. It's all open source. Go grab it and download it and compile it and contribute back to it, whatever. If you want to donate money, that's great. I don't wow. know. What else I got? There you go. That's what I do. So check it out. And uh, there you have it. So you find that at Lunduke.com. All right, B Man, well, the Linux Action Show is live on Sundays at 10 a.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv or jblive.am or fm. Have I, uh, this is a completely, completely a side thing. Okay. So uh, I just want to end, end the show talking about uh, uh, one thing uh, that's, that's kind of random. All right. Um, I, had a glass, so I had a sip of water, so I'm ready. I've had some nice email exchanges with, uh, with Stallman over the last couple of weeks. <laughs> um, Your pen pal? Yeah, my, 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 my buddy pen pal, Richard Stallman. And, uh, you know, I just want to say this. Um, very, very gracious and nice. Yeah. Uh, everything's been very cordial and, uh, you know, uh, very supportive of each other. And uh, it's been really nice. It's been really nice to have kind of those sorts of conversations with someone that maybe I disagree with on so many levels. But we've kind of been able to kind of see where we agree with each other and kind of come to that. Uh, and I and I really like that, and I, I kind of want to give you know Stallman RMS a kind of a kudo. Uh, someone in the chat was asked when the wedding. No wedding. Oh, um, we could have broadcasted uh, that because, though. Yeah, he likes parents. I'm just kidding. I don't know. I don't know how to think about it. I, just, I don't want to say that. He does like. Well, he, don't he, give I, him read, a I read something about don't, it. don't give him a parent. Don't give him a parent. I just thought that was the yeah, funniest. There are a thing lot ever. of responsibility. Uh, but no, it's very. It was very cordial, very nice, and and it's been very, very pleasant. Um, until the, now. On the other hand, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Until now, now there's going to be a parrot war between us. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand. Um, some of you may have seen as I go through this whole trying to make a living off of doing open source thing that I've been doing, um, some people have been angry about it. Some people have gotten upset about it. And I've been trying to figure out why. And I kind of threw this out there to people on like G Plus and a few other places. I'm like, what, what is going on with some of these folks? Some folks just seem genuinely pissed off at the idea that someone would earn a living making open source software or hmm. working on it. I mean, and it's not many people. It's just this few couple of people. And uh, I just wanted to throw this out there because uh, uh, our buddy Aaron Saigo chimed in with this thought. And I kind of want to leave you guys with this. It's the crabs in a bucket thing where you take a bucket of crabs that you've been fishing out of the harbor. Okay, okay. If those crabs, there's six crabs in that bucket. Yeah, six crabs. They could easily jump out of that bucket if they work together, you know? They could kind of stand on each other and help each other get out. They have claws and legs and they're long enough. They could totally get out of that bucket to safety if they wanted to. 
but they're crabs in a bucket. They're, they see one crab getting up there and doing good. They're going to claw and grab at that crab and just yank them down. And because of that, crabs never escape from buckets. Hmm. That and sounds I, like communism. <laughs> <laughs> Does that sound like communism to you? But you know, they they, they kind of got me thinking. And and you know what? And and some people like Aaron Sag and a few other people have mentioned that they've seen that a lot within the open source community, where most people are supportive, but there's just these this 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 motley crew out there that are the crabs in our buckets, right, right? That are just seeing people try and succeed, and they just pull them down. And and it's not just that you know people are trying to pull me down or something like that. I've seen people do the same thing for the parted magic guy. The parted magic guy is yeah. trying to raise like three cents. Like this guy is trying to raise like almost no money. And I've seen people complain that he's trying to do See, it. I think the problem And it's is- a very, very small minority. But man, are those guys loud. And I just wanted to make that call out there to, you know what? There's a lot of you guys out there that have been supportive, guys and gals, supportive, mm. awesome. Some of you guys have kind of stayed on the sidelines. Some of you guys have gotten in the fray. Some of you guys have gotten really involved. And you're all pretty awesome. And we're all trying to support each other, even if we're trying to do things a little differently because we're in it for the same cause. There's just a couple people out there that are trying to be loud. People like crap with butter brian well crab is delicious and if they crawl out of the bucket they don't get to have crab with butter well but see if they crawl out of the bucket then they're free and they could eat other crabs but if they stay in the bucket no no they could eat themselves but who will know who eats the crab well i do exactly but i don't want to be in the bucket no the crabs are all in the bucket is what i'm saying maybe some people aren't in the bucket maybe they want you to stay in the bucket See, now I just want crab. I know, because people love crab. This is the problem with the crab analogy, is you're going to get people on the side of staying in the bucket because they like crab and butter. Anyway, it's flawed, man. I it's just flawed. Wanted to, I just wanted to throw that out there uh, because it kind of sparked some interesting conversations. And one of the reasons I want to say this is I know people are saying Google Plus is dead. But man, some of the greatest conversations yeah, I've had yeah. over the last it few depends. weeks have it, been happening over on Google+. It Plus. depends on Google+. Plus. You know, there's some, like, I think it's got a higher tech crowd ratio. Than Maybe that's places. what it is. But like, we're having conversations with great people. You know, the guy who used to do the This Week in Linux that now is over a, on a XDA forum. Yeah. Uh, yeah you know, Aaron yeah. Seigo. A bunch of other great yeah. folks are, are hanging out on the Google+, Plus, having really interesting conversations. Yeah. And uh, it's a phenomenal place to be. So you can find the links over on the site and everywhere else. On the show notes there, B-Man. The notes in the such all right well there you go that's all i had to say okay everyone well thank you so much for tuning into this week and hearing all about brian's crabs we'll be right back here next week open web open web os is here open web os is here i wish i had like a narcolepsy that happened just like one time ever but then I could use that as an excuse to be like, oh, sorry, narcolepsy. Uh, oh.